what if this 68-year-old gentleman came in to us and he had a prior history of diabetes, maybe he had coronary artery bypass and was more sedentary, spent much of his day um, in, a, in a wheelchair or, or wasn't or, re or relied on his family members for a lot of his uh, activities of daily living, then this is a patient in front of me who I probably am not thinking will tolerate a stem cell transplant. And it's a patient for whom I think we would focus a lot more on the quality of life. And um, fortunately, there's lots of new therapies to benefit this patient population as well. But it would probably be a patient who I think many of us would argue uh, may not experience a lot of the benefits of induction chemotherapy. So for a patient in that situation, we have a couple of other new FDA-approved therapies. Um, that would include glastigib in combination with uh, low-dose citerabine or venetoclax in combination with HMA. And so I think that we'd have a long conversation with that patient um, and kind of discuss all the options, but both of those would be good options for, for that patient. I think the other unique patient might be a patient who comes into us who, for instance, maybe has an impaired performance status at the time I meet them because of a complication of the leukemia itself. Maybe they have a pretty severe pneumonia, an infection, and so for the time being, their performance status uh, is less than adequate for induction chemotherapy or transplant, but that with time I might be able to improve. Maybe that patient could get some rehab and actually um, improve and go to transplant. Then that patient is someone who we might use one of these therapies as a bridge to transplant um, while we wait for their performance status to improve. I think that if that patient was, was borderline um, and at 68, we're, we're deciding between intensive therapy and um, more gentle, um, potentially palliative therapy, then I think that's a really personal decision. As I mentioned, I think um, any patient over the 60, age of 65, uh, it's really important that we consider that patient's own preference in terms of the toxicities which they're willing to tolerate. Um, but I think that would be a personal decision between us and the patients. I might err more on the side of um, one of the more gentle therapies, one of the ones we mentioned, like Vixios, I'm sorry, like Venetoclax and HMA or Glastigib and low-dose Cytarabine. I think other important considerations, we mentioned the patient's preference. Um, so some of that's important in regards to the toxicity profile. It's also important to um, where that patient would like to be because one of the important things we haven't discussed as much is the fact that most of our patients with Vixios are going to be treated for a substantially longer time in the hospital and that can be something that uh, our patients are really averse to so I think that's another consideration we might take into account is the likelihood of hospitalization or the need for hospitalization in some settings for induction chemotherapy. I think the other consideration would be that um, you know the NCC panel, as NCCN panel of experts, also agreed with the importance of these improved responses in the Vixios arm. And for patients over the age of 60 who have a secondary or treatment-related AML, Vixios is a category one endorsement um, for induction therapy for those folks. So I think this really represents our new standard of care for patients with treatment-related or secondary AML.